cannot find the reason just why a royal king would leave his throne he looked on all humanity and loved us enough to don a robe of flesh and bone he knew that they would mock him and they'd beat him but still he chose to be our sacrifice That was a blessing. Uh, we're going to be in Psalms chapter 123. Psalms 123. Make you mindful of a few things. One is in your bulletin this morning. Uh, there's two different things, two different inserts. Um, one is a bookmark, and this is a Romans Road plan of salvation, and this is just a, a foundation building block for sharing your faith. It's important for every Christian to be familiar with the verses here in this bookmark. Uh, and this was a gift to our church by, um, I call her Grandma Grace, a lady who led my mother to the Lord. And uh, she wanted to give this to all of you. So that's in the bulletin. That's from Grandma Grace this morning for you. And uh, if you want some more, she, I don't know, she must be 
thought we were running a mega church or something. She sent me a big box. Uh, and so there's more in the back um, if you'd like more of those. And then um, I've always been a part of uh, churches that would give out a Bible reading schedule. And uh, I remember we used to give out beautiful ones. They were color and several pages. And I remember uh, asking at the end of the year, how many use that uh, Bible guide to, um, to get through the Bible this year? It'd be like zero, okay? Um, but uh, a lot of times they get lost or whatever. They're too complicated. Uh, this one right here, as you can see, there's a little cutout, and you can actually tape it in the inside cover of your Bible. And it's 365 sections of Scripture. So, you know, you get into Second Chronicles, and there's 10 chapters of begats. So begat, 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 so and so begat. And you're like, ah, I don't, I'm not getting anything out of this. I need to go someplace else. Uh, you can jump around in your scripture reading and it's broken down to 365 uh, sections so you can cross them off as you go. Uh, so I hope that'd be a blessing to you. I know a lot of us are reading through uh, the New Testament this month. We gave away those bookmarks. Uh, I think there's some more in the back if you lost yours. And so be mindful of that. And then uh, next Sunday, we'll have. Uh, Brother James Alter preaching for us, and you'll be in for a treat and a blessing. Uh, and then meat feast, 5 o'clock Saturday. Alvin, I expect you to be there. <laughs> um, but uh, there, there'll probably be about 100 fellas that'll be out. Uh, and so we are going to need some volunteers to be here a little bit early, some men about 4.30. If you can be there, it starts at 5. Uh, and what we're going to do is uh, we're going to have two different lines for serving, and the guy's going to come through the line, and I want to serve them very quickly. They're going to sit down. We're going to keep all the desserts covered uh, after they get done gorging themselves with all uh, different uh, array of meat. And it is going to live up to its name, by the way. There's going to be plenty of meat for everybody to eat. Uh, and so Brother Alter, after we get done eating, is gonna, we're going to sing a few songs. He's going to preach to us over in the side room back here. And again, I, I'm guessing that we should have about 100 guys here. And, uh, and so he's going to preach to us back there. After he's done preaching, we're going to unveil the desserts. So we're not going to keep you all night, uh, but it's going to be a blessing. It'll be a fun time of camaraderie. It'll be a fun time together as men. And it is important uh, that uh, men of God get together. Iron sharpeneth iron. Um, and uh, that we would just challenge each other in the Christian life and, and in the Christian faith. So that'll be this Saturday at 5 o'clock. And so please be there, men. And I'll be in the back there signing you up back there all right and so it's five dollars best five bucks you ever spent in your life okay you can't even get a hamburger for five bucks anymore you know that yes mrs major It's a prayer advance. It says the role of prayer is to advance God's kingdom on earth. And the prayer advance is a place where men and women touch heaven. So they have a men's prayer advance in January. But the woman's one is in March. Um, my name is the only one on the list so far out there. <laughs> I'm going to go. I already paid my registration fee. So um, if you guys want to come with me, just sign the um, list on the back there. And we'll do a carpooling thing. Yeah, I thought it would be really fun. But... Um, you can sign up online, or there are registration forms on the back table as well. And there's a um, website right on the card here that you can write down and go online and sign up. Um, so I think this is just really, really important, you know, for us to pray and get together and learn how to pray and to um, encourage, be encouraged in the Lord. So. Amen. Amen. All right. Psalms 123. If you haven't found your place there by now. Just look at the page where you're at, okay? And uh, we'll, we'll uh, stand together and we're going to read uh, Psalms 123, all four verses there. And we're gonna, I'm going to preach a message this morning entitled, Looking Past Everything Else. Looking Past Everything Else. Uh, Psalms 123, verse number one. Unto thee lift I up mine eyes, O thou that dwellest in the heavens. 
Behold, as the eyes of servants look unto the hand of their masters, and as the eyes of a maiden unto the hand of her mistress, so our eyes wait upon the Lord our God until He have mercy upon us. Have mercy upon us, O Lord. Have mercy upon us, for we are exceedingly filled with contempt. Our soul is exceedingly filled with the, con with the scorning of those that are at ease and with the contempt of the proud. And uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask His blessing on the service today. Let's pray together. Lord, we love you and we thank you for being just a wonderful God to us. And we thank you for just the past week that you've brought us through. And Lord, we thank you for how your guiding hand has blessed us. We thank you for this day that you have made. We thank you for the strength and the health to be here in your house today. Lord, I pray that you bless each and every one that is here. I pray for those who are watching online this morning, that you would bless them. Lord, I pray that you would strengthen us, your flock. Lord, I pray that you would help us just to see our life journey in Psalms 123. I pray that we would look past everything else to the God of heaven. And Lord, we pray these things in Jesus' name and for his sake and glory. Amen. You may be seated. So Psalms are prayers unto God. If you're ever stuck in your prayer life and you don't know how to articulate a prayer to the Lord, open up the book of Psalms and just meditate upon those things and adopt the psalmist prayers as your own prayers. And you can petition the throne of God through the word of God in the book of Psalms. As you know, Proverbs teaches us how to walk with men. Psalms teaches us how to walk with God. And there's men there in the Bible and saints of God who have experienced the same things. Remember, it's no temptation has taken you, but such as is common to men. So these words here were by psalmists who experienced the same exact things that you are going through this morning and have articulated prayers unto God. Uh, this particular portion of scripture from Psalms 120 through Psalms 136 in your Bible are going to be labeled Psalms of Degrees. They're known as Hallel Psalms or Hallelujah Psalms, Praise to the Lord Psalms, and pilgrims would sing these songs as they journeyed to Mount Zion, the city of Jerusalem, uh, the heavenly city, the city of the great God, the city of the great King, as they'd make their journey upward towards Jerusalem. Uh, and it didn't matter if you came from the north, south, east, or west, you went up to Jerusalem. It was the city on a hill, and you would ascend up there into Jerusalem. And these were songs that saints would sing as they ascended upward into glory. If you are a child of God here this morning and you receive the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior uh, and the Lord lives in your heart this morning, you too have an ascension upward. You are on a journey up to the Lord, up to the city of Zion. Uh, and that is the, the joy of all creation. Evelyn's sister has made that journey, has made that trip Amen. rejoicing. In the Lord, I, uh, I preached a funeral for Arun Mandel this last Wednesday, and I used Psalms 120. Look at it here, Psalms 122. I was glad when they said unto me, Let us go into the house of our God. Our feet shall stand within thy gates, O Jerusalem. Uh, and so Arun, when he took his last breath on earth, that was his first breath in heaven. Uh, and he, he could say this, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of our God. Then he says to us, our feet shall stand within thy gates, O Jerusalem. Uh, you know, when you think of your job as I, I'm an under shepherd, I have an official position as pastor of Christ's flock, you're not my flock, you're Christ. Uh, and all, all I'm supposed to do, we're strangers and pilgrims in this world, is that we are traveling together, 
We're traveling together for a short period of time. This is only a temporary traveling group together, but we are His flock. We're traveling together and we're ascending upward. Uh, and so we're just getting from this destination to that destination and we get to do it together as a church family, that you and I are strangers and pilgrims, and we too, as well, as these pilgrims would make their journey into the city of God, you and I, as well, are making a pilgrimage, a journey. Uh, you go to a cemetery, it's in a cemetery Wednesday, and uh, doing a graveside, and uh, it always is a solemn and a somber place, and I, you know, and I, I think that cemeteries are a great place uh, to go and they're quiet, it's a good place to pray. And then it also is a reminder to you and I that we are only here on this earth temporarily. It's going to say on my gravestone, 1978. And I don't know what the end date is. Could be 2022. Uh, but there is an expiration date. You know that each and every one of you have term limits. Uh, that you're only going to be here for a short time, that we have a short window of service, and, uh, and we're going from here to there, and there's an ascension that is upward. The psalmist, as they would sing on their journey, uh, they would sing things like, look at Psalms 121. Un I will lift up mine eyes to the hills from whence cometh my help. This was a city of hills. This was a city of God's natural protection. And there were different hills in Israel. I think of the hill of their godly heritage. I think of Abraham who went to Mount Moriah there in the city of Jerusalem where uh, the temple of God was. And he did sacrifice to Melchizedek without beginning, without ending. Uh, a king and a priest and sacrificed unto him a representative, a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, we see there in Mount Moriah. And then God would say to Abraham, Abraham, take thy son, thine only begotten son, Isaac, unto a hill that I will show thee. Where was this hill? It was Mount Moriah. It was the city of God. And take uh, Isaac and go sacrifice him unto me. And Abraham took his most valued possession in the world and placed it on an altar before God and demonstrated that Mount Moriah was going to be a place of sacrifice. And then you remember King David, the man after God's own heart, loved the Lord and desired for God to have a temple there in Jerusalem. God said to to David, you are a bloody man, you are a man of war, but your son will be a son of peace. And he's going to be represented of the king of peace that will rule and reign there in Mount Zion. And Solomon will build unto me a temple to Almighty God. And Solomon built uh, the temple, one of the glories of uh, the whole then known world. And remember that the glory of God came and abode upon that temple mount. That was a godly heritage unto the hills. Uh, will I lift up mine eyes? You know, I am so thankful uh, to be a part of a long line and a long heritage of godly men and godly women who have served the Lord from righteous Abel all the way down through the ages. And we have a great heritage that has been given unto you and I. We're part of something special here this morning, an unbroken chain from the beginning of creation all the way through is that we have a goodly heritage, faith of our fathers, holy faith. We shall be true to thee till death. We're in good company this morning. The company of the prophets, of the priests, and of the mighty men and mighty women of God who have served God. You know, and I look back over my life and I've looked at, back over uh, the people and the men and women of God who have been an influence to me that have given their life uh, to pour their lives into other people and minister to me the Lord Jesus Christ, and to others that were around them. We read the, the stories of old, great Christian men and Christian women of faith who have laid down their lives, have given themselves, given everything that they have, even life itself, for the propagation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We've had a goodly heritage. And so they look unto the hills, and then in Psalms 122, in verse number 1, then he says, they look to the house of the Lord, the sanctuary of God. Psalms 122, 1. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of our God. 
I'll tell you, I was excited to be in church this morning. I don't have to go to church. I get to go to church. It is a privilege to be in the house of the Lord. It's a privilege to be in the company of the saints. Uh, we're here, the children of Israel. Uh, God, we, uh, we looked at last week, Moses, remember Moses, Mount Sinai? He said, I will now go turn aside to see this great sight. Uh, wherein the bush burns, but it is not consumed. Uh, and there God says, you go tell Pharaoh, let my people go. And he says, another, amongst other things, he says, you bring my people to me to worship me on this mount, on Mount Sinai. Moses goes in there by a mighty hand. God delivers his people by the hand of Moses. And they come out, they're baptized, and the, Moses into the Red Sea, and they're out there in the wilderness, and they go up Mount Sinai. You can't lead someone to where you've never been be spiritually before. He leads them back to the place where he met God there on Mount Sinai. And all the 70 elders and Moses and Joshua, they go up in the mount, and they meet with God. And God up there, he gives them a pattern and he gives them provision. And he says that you are going to make a tabernacle and this tabernacle is going to represent my salvation plan in heaven. This tabernacle is going to be a representative, all types, shadows and figures of him who is to come. And here is the reason why you're going to make this tabernacle. Just not to have some goofy religious system, some empty, hollow religious system. He says, I will dwell in the midst of my people. You know what God was going to do with the tabernacle? There was going to be a restoration of the Garden of Eden where God walked with man in the cool of the day. Do you know that God desires fellowship with his people? That God wants to uh, dwell here on this earth? That God desires a sanctuary for his people to meet? And right there in the midst of the camp of Israel, God himself dwelled through this perfect pattern that a holy God could dwell with a sinful man. We're having family devotions this week. And Adriana asks, how, it says, no man can see God and live. How come, how, come, how come we can't see God and live? I said, well, you're a sinner and I'm a sinner and no sin can be in the presence of God. Amen. You know what you have to do to see God? You're going to have to leave this sinful body, this sinful flesh, or you're going to have to get translated upward. You're going to have to get... Uh, taken upward and given a new body made like as unto the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, so I woke up in the middle of the night last night. My finger is not dirty if you're shaking my hand this morning. It is broken, okay? How'd you break your finger? He didn't break his finger. He cut it off, in case you're one. See, the guy's been playing with the knives, and that's what happened. Um, last night I woke up several times. My finger ached. Anyway, this is beside the point. If you wake up in the middle of the night and you see God, guess what? You died in your sleep, right? Okay? But God made a provision. He made a way that he could dwell in the midst of a sinful people. There was a sacrificial, sacrificial system that pointed to the perfect sacrifice that was to come. And so God himself dwelled. He had a sanctuary in the midst of his people. Uh, you know what the disciples said about the Lord Jesus Christ in John chapter number 1, verse number 14? Uh, that he became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Uh, so when the Lord Jesus Christ was made in flesh, that he was clothed, he was tabernacled among his people. You know what we celebrate at Christmas time? Emmanuel, meaning God with us. What's always been the desire of God for his people? That he would dwell in the midst of his people. Now, when the Lord Jesus Christ came, uh, he humbled himself. He didn't come in all of his glory. You want to see Jesus in all of his glory? Read John chapter, no I'm sorry, Revelation chapter number one. And John fell at his feet as dead. Okay? And you would as well if you saw Jesus in all his glory. But when Jesus came in his humility, he was clothed in flesh like as unto us. Isaiah chapter number 53, it says there, he has no comeliness uh, that we should, when we should behold him, that he looked average. But you know what the disciples said? But we beheld his glory. They saw inside of that tabernacle. Now, the Old Testament tabernacle made of badger skins. And uh, you look on the outside, you think, what is special about that tent? 
What's so great about that tent? Well, it's not what's on the outside. It's what's on the inside, the Shekinah glory of God. The worshipers inside that tabernacle had experienced God. And the followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, those disciples had experienced God. And we beheld His glory. Now, the Lord Jesus Christ, when He died for your sins and He died for my sins on that cross, He offered up His perfect life for my sinful life. And He offered up the free gift of salvation. He became Jack Young on that cross, took upon himself my sins and your sins, was uh, died, buried, rose again, went to the right hand of the Father. Why did he do this? You know what it says in, in Ephesians? It says, so that the church of God, that we would be the temple of God by the Spirit. We would be the habitation of God by the Spirit. What does it say in Matthew chapter number 18 where two or three are gathered together in my name? There I am in the midst. You know where the church gathers? There is the manifest presence of Almighty God as the Holy Spirit moves in my life and in your life and there's a habitation of God through the Spirit. You know what Jesus says in Revelations 1 through 3 repeatedly? I am he that walks in the midst of the churches. You know one of the reasons why when you get saved, you desire to be in church? You no longer have to go out of guilt. Unsaved people have to go out of guilt, okay? Uh, but, uh, you know, once you get saved and, uh, and you get a new nature, uh, there is a desire to be with the people of God because there's something you can get in the church house that you can't get anywhere else. And it's just an amazing thing. You know, if you're excited about any one thing in life, you want to gather with other people who are excited about that same very thing. You know, if you really love bowling. <laughs> some people are, apparently. Man, they're part of the bowling league, aren't they? If you really like motorcycles, you go out with the boys and ride. You talk about my shiny chrome new this or that or the other. Hunting, hunting camp, you know. Uh, in you know, if you're excited about the Lord Jesus Christ, there is a group of people, and uh, they're called Christ Church, and you get together, and the Bible says that the manifest presence of God is inside the midst of that congregation. So he said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of our God. And I say, you know, for every friend I gave up after I got saved, and I thought, man, I, I never get this quality of friendships. Any, you know, I'm, I'm just giving up so much to follow the Lord. You know, for every friend that I gave up to be a Christian. They were going one direction. I was going a different. That, uh, that uh, I received a hundredfold friends of much better quality. And there's nothing inherently better in, in us than anything in the world. But tell, let me tell you something. It's the Lord Jesus Christ in us that is glorious, that is glorified. But you know, in our psalm this morning, Psalms 123, we're looking past the heritage we're looking past the hills and all, all of the meaning that is there. And then even we're looking past the temple of God itself to the God of the house of God. I, I was preaching a men's meeting on Friday night for Dr. John Ashquith and I was interviewing him, I was talking to him, and he's got a lot of people in his church that were led to Christ in that church, and he's worked on discipling them and mentoring them. Uh, a lot of his congregants, he is the only pastor that they have ever known. Uh, but he was telling me, he says, you know, he's like, let's say that I committed adultery and messed up big time and just made a fool out of myself and had to leave the ministry. He says, I know those people would be heartbroken. They would be sad. He says, but I know this. They wouldn't give up the faith because they're not following me. They are following the Lord Jesus Christ. And so here is the fix. Here is the gaze of the saints there in Psalms 123. Remember we said last week about uh, Jacob. He's leading his family back to Bethel. Bethel is where he had a head of stone. And before you can see the ladder, the ladder going up into heaven, you've got to have a pillow of stone. I mean, you've got to have a rough time. You know, when the outward, is, the outward is looking bleak, then you finally look up. And that's where Jacob looked up. And he said, the Lord is in this place. And I knew it not. This is called the temple. This is called the house of God, Bethel. 
Now, when he took his family back there, remember he renamed it El Bethel, meaning the God of the house of God. You know, I, I drug my children to church this morning. You know, they didn't have to ask me, are we going to church today? I never had to ask my parents either. Uh, and so they're here. They're in the house of God. But you know what I want them to find inside the house of God? The God of the house of God. And, and so here they say that we're looking to the God of the house of God. Psalms 123. Look at verse number 1. It says, Unto thee lift I up mine eyes, O thou that dwellest in the heavens. So they looked past the pattern that God had given on the holy mount there in the temple. They looked past the priesthood and they looked to the person of Almighty God. You and I should fix our gaze upon God. We see the focus of the look and it is to God Himself. They look past everything else and they look to His person. Number two, I want you to notice in verse two, the force of the look. The focus of the look was upon God. The force of the look, it says, Behold, as the eyes of the serpents look unto the hand of their masters, and as the eyes of the maiden unto the hand of the mistress, so our eyes wait upon the Lord our God until he have mercy upon us. Um, Here's the attentiveness of the look. They're looking to Almighty God as a servant looks to his master. Uh, now, we, uh, we've taken many trips, Julie and I have, up in, we were living in Watertown. We we're about 30 minutes from Alexandria Bay. How many ever went up to A Bay, up to Alexandria Bay? How many ever went to, on Uncle Sam's boat tours? It's awesome. You need to do it. You need to do it. Uh, and so they have different tours there, of course, pretty much. How many have been to Hart Castle? Okay, quite a few people. How many have been to Singer Castle? Margaret Singer. Very interesting. If you want to understand progressivism in the uh, United States, study Margaret Singer, okay? And uh, you'll see what they're all about. And so Margaret Singer came from a very wealthy uh, family there. And the Singers, they had Singer um, sewing machines, and that's where they established a lot of their wealth. Uh, it's very interesting inside their house. You know how you're watching some... Um, some spooky show and uh, they're in some sort of like a mansion and then there's a picture on the wall and then there's the holes and somebody's looking out. <laughs> you know that was actually a real thing in mansions and you go to, to, to Margaret Sanger and the Sanger family's castle and you'll see that there's little stairways and there's little passages for the servants uh, behind the wall and uh, what they were supposed to do uh, is they, they were supposed to stand back there and they were to watch their master, they watch their mistress uh, and they were to watch and to see if they had any needs at all. Now if you've worked for somebody for a long time, I mean you know their likes, their dislikes, you even know their body language, it says as a servant looks to the hand of his master. I mean, even the very position of his hand would, um, would tell the servant. I mean, they're not even, they're just, they just know the body language of the master because they just keep on looking at the master. Remember Moses last week is that he continually looked to God in the face uh, and he was a friend of God. Jesus says, I have called you friends because you do whatsoever my Father hath commanded you that we are in a partnership with God. Uh, and so they are looking uh, unto the Lord and they are waiting upon the Lord. Isaiah 40, 31, some of you that's your favorite passage in the Bible. And they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. They that wait upon the Lord. Now this waiting isn't sitting on the couch. This waiting is the waiting of a servant suspended in service. That means that when the master moves, I move. And when the master stops, I stop. And so when I am in submission to the master, I'm actually an extension of the master himself. You know, this is the exciting thing when we look at God and we know that he has given us direction in 
our life that we are ex an extension of the kingdom of God. We're an extension of the king himself. And we are God's ambassadors and we are God's ministers here upon this earth. Let me tell you something, that if you are in submission to God and your eyes are fixed upon God, that you are invincible to all others in submitted unto God. Think of the Apostle Paul. Jesus said to him, you will testify of me in Rome. I mean, here are three shipwrecks, beatings, imprisonments. And he says, well, I ain't, I ain't been to Rome yet. <laughs> so, you know, I, I'm troubled on every side, but I am not cast down. I've been knocked down, but not knocked out that I'm still in the fight because I am serving the Lord Jesus Christ. And he said, I'm going to Rome and nothing's going to stop me until I go stand in Rome. Uh, same thing with Peter. Peter uh, was told by the Lord, when thou art old, thou shalt be taken up. You know, imprisonment, he'd say, hey, anybody got a mirror in here? You know, and they pass down a piece of mirror around the bars and he looks at himself and you know I've got a few gray hairs but not, I ain't old yet this isn't it this isn't over uh, because the Lord said when I am old that's when they're going to kill me and I ain't old yet uh, that I am invincible to man because I am in subjection unto God and this should be a very exciting thing for you and I that when we are yielded to God that we are instruments of God that we are an extension of our master we're an extension of him because he moves us about from place to place and we are waiting upon him now notice here that there is an attentiveness to this look to the master and then there's also a spirit of expectancy from the master as well. He's waiting, he's suspended in service, but then also there's something that they need from God that can't be given from any other source in any other place. Look at verse number two again. Behold, the eyes of the servants look unto the hand of their masters, and as the eyes of the maiden unto the hand of her mistress, so are eyes Wait upon the Lord our God until he have mercy upon us. Then it says, have mercy upon us, O Lord. Have mercy upon us. So notice three different cries for mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. So in four short verses, three times there is calls out for mercy. Let me give you a definition of mercy. Uh, mercy is this. Mercy means to properly to bend down or stoop in kindness to an inferior, entreat or have pity upon. Now, a lot of times we, we look at God's mercy and it is like this. Lord, please forgive me for this. I should have mercy upon me. Lord, I know that, uh, that I deserve the penalty for this sin or this punishment, have mercy upon me. A lot of times we look at mercy as forgiveness. Uh, but to bend down with pity, to stoop down to our level, is this is, this is uh, what this is talking about here. Remember the, the um, lady with the demon-possessed daughter that comes to the Lord and begs him to have mercy upon her and he made as if he was ignoring her and she falls down at his feet and worships him uh, and says, uh, and he says to her, testing her faith, he says, uh, it's not me for the master to take the children's bread and give it to dogs. And she says, yes, Lord, I am a dog, but even the dogs get the crumbs that fall from the master's table. And he says, woohoo, I have not found such faith. And, and so he accommodates her faith. He has mercy upon her. He hears her plight, stoops down, and he saves her demoniac daughter. Uh, there's another man that comes to Jesus with a lunatic son. How many have a lunatic son? Um, first, first time my dad ever preached for me in, up in Black River, he, he opened up the, the verse and he says, Lord, have mercy upon me for my son is a lunatic. Just joking around. And uh, that means a lunar gazer staring at the moon. I mean, here, here, here is another son that is underneath the influence of Satan. Did you know this, that you're no match for the devil? You know what the Bible says? You wrestle not against flesh and blood. 
You can talk yourself till you're blue in the face to your demon-possessed daughter or your lunatic son, and it's going to do you absolutely no good. You know what you need is mercy. You need heaven to stoop down to earth and do something about that situation and do something about that predicament. You know what the lepers would say when they came up to Jesus? Now, leper in the Bible, he never healed the leper. He cleansed them. You know, we, uh, we sing. Brad heard me got to sing on Friday. I was feeling good. I had a five-hour energy, and I was all <laughs> fired up. And uh, so I was singing to those men, There is a fountain filled with blood, drawn from Emmanuel's veins, and sinners plunge beneath that flood, lose all their guilty stains. A dying thief rejoiced to see that fountain in his day, and there may I, though vile is he, lose all their guilty stains. You know what it said in Isaiah? It says there, they, Come, let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be made white as snow. So here's what scarlet was. It was a double dip stain. You ladies would have loved it. That clothing was stained so good, you could wash it again and again and again and again and again and again. It would never lose its vibrant color. You know your sin is the same way? You can scrub all you want, but you ain't going to scrub your sins off. You know what you need is mercy. You know what you are, apart from Jesus Christ, is an unclean leper. You know what you need is the Almighty to cleanse you. Christ never healed the leper. He cleansed the leper, if you look in Scripture, that they would come, the unclean would touch the clean, and here's something that doesn't happen anywhere else in Scripture, anywhere else in Scripture, if unclean, if I come up here, I've had this tickle in my throat and been real sick. I want to get healthy. You guys healthy? Well, I'm going to cough on you, and then your health is going to give me Is that the way it works? No. The Lord Jesus Christ is the only one who is clean that I can come unclean and get clean. And so the lepers would come, Lord, have mercy on me. Bend down, stoop, have pity. Do something here. Other people come to Christ and ask for mercy. The blind man. Lord, have mercy upon us. Oh, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy upon us. They're saying, see our plight. Open up our eyes. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. That saved the wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found was blind. But now I see. Lord, have mercy upon me. Open up thou mine eyes. And notice here the, the fill of the look. So we have the focus of the look was on Christ. The force of the look as a, as a servant to a master. And then also depending upon the master. And then finally, notice here's the reason why they're asking for mercy. Have mercy upon us, O Lord. Have mercy upon us. Have mercy upon us three times. Verse number three, for we are exceedingly filled with contempt and our souls is exceeding filled with scorning of those that are at ease with the contempt of the proud. So it says, we're filled with contempt. We're filled with scorning. Now let me give you some definitions of contempt and scorn. Contempt, disparaging or haughty disdain. To take lightly or to disrespect. Uh, so con contempt would be that I would take light of something you great, took great stock in. Um, here's scorn. An object considered despicable or unworthy. So here are these people that were pilgrims. They're headed to Zion. Uh, they're looking up to the hills. They're looking up to the house of God. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of our God. Uh, you know, and I, I think of uh, the men and women of God who, I, you know, I look up to and they've given everything uh, for the heritage. They've given everything for the house of the Lord God and for the people of the Lord God. And then finally for God itself. And let me tell you something. You're a Christian. You're in the big time. I tell you, you're, you're somebody. You are a child of the king. You're kings and priests unto God, and you ought to hold your head high. You want some self-esteem this morning? Okay, I'm going to aim the police. You know how much God loves you? Herein we understand the love of God. 
While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Amen. I'm prized possession this morning. I'm a child of God. So what in the world does it mean here that the psalmist is filled with contempt and filled with scorn? You know what? It's not the, their own contempt. They're not holding anything in light esteem or they're not scoffing at anything. It's the contempt and it's the scorn of those that are at ease and of the proud. Look, if you will, here. Verse 4. Our soul is exceedingly filled with the scorning of those that are at ease and with the contempt of the proud. Those that are at ease are the ones who don't lift a finger for the faith. How many ever heard this verse? Be sure your sin will find you out. It's always good to look at verses in context. I know it's fun to preach them out of context, but uh, it's not really good practice. Um, you know who that verse was given unto? It was given to the Reubenites. What were the Reubenites doing? They were settling on the other side of the Jordan, and they were going to let their brethren go in and, and fight in the land of Canaan, and they were going to sit on the couch and watch their brothers and sisters go in there and fight a bunch of walled cities and giants and all sorts of uh, nations that were there in Canaan land. And here's the charge given from God. If you do not go in and help your brethren fight, be sure your sin will find you out. There's people, man, we have a great faith. We have a great fight. Uh, we have a great cause. We're headed to a great place. But you know, there's other people that don't see it that way. Now, it's really easy for people on the outside, but how about you got people in your own family who look at the faith that you hold so dear that you would, Lord willing, I mean, a soldier never knows what he's going to do in battle until it's there. I'd like to think that I'd die for the faith. Amen. Deny Christ or die. Oh, cut my head off or take, you know, take, I'm hoping I'd do that. I know one thing, you know, uh, that, uh, boy, I just, man, I'd hope when that day came, I'd stand for the faith. But there's, there's a faith that you and I, God willing, would die for. And then there's a faith that you and I live for. It's the reason why we get up in the morning. It's the reason why we do what we do. It is the purpose for our life. And then there's people around, and it's heavy inside of us when people don't in experience what we experience in God and don't value the things that we value in God and when you have someone who is proud and at ease and doesn't need the things of God and they could take it or leave it and he says here's the reason why Lord you need to bend down and stoop down and have mercy upon us is because we're filled with contempt from those that are around us you know, the Bible says this, closing with this thought. Straight is the gate, and narrow is the way that leads unto life, and few there be that go in thereat. Remember Christ Church? Eleven, heaven I not chosen twelve of you, and one of you is the devil. You know, it was a pretty small church that Christ had. Remember, he had great crowds. I mean, especially, man, when he was feeding them. I mean, people come out for food, amen? Especially good food, like breakfast for lunch and things like that. People come out for that stuff. All right, so he's five loaves, two fishes, great multitudes, great crowds. And then, will ye also go away? How many people were in the upper room? 120. Let me ask you something. You think he would have been in that prayer meeting of the 120? Boy, there was a lot of people. They followed Christ when it came right down to it is they were apathetic, scornful, and held with contempt, the crucified Christian life. Here's what the Lord says about our day and age. When the, when the Lord comes again, will he find faith on the earth? There's one place that you are going to have to look if you are going to make it in the Christian life. 
you're going to have to look past the Christian heritage. I thank God for the great heritage that we've had. Last 6,000 years of human history and all the saints of God, Old Testament and New Testament, that have given all for Christ. That's a great heritage, but that's not going to do it for you. You're going to have to look past the great men and women of God. You're going to have to even look past the household of faith, the sanctuary of God, the church of God, and you're going to have to look to the throne of God and you are going to have to receive mercy from God if you are going to endure the scorn and endure the contempt, take it or leave it attitude of those that are around you. And if we do, blessed are the merciful for they shall receive mercy. Turn your eyes to the Lord this morning. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the Psalms of degrees, the Psalms of ascending. And Lord, we are pilgrims, we are strangers headed to that heavenly city. Think of David. He says, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. We thank you for our home in heaven. Lord, I pray that you'd have mercy upon us along life's journey, along life's way. That's the only way that we can make it is that you would have mercy from heaven upon us. And Lord, I pray that you would help us this morning just to turn our eyes to the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all Thank you so much for watching today. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. If you would email us at mylbbc at gmail.com, we'll send you your very own copy of this book right here. It's called Done, What Most Religions Don't Teach You About God's Word. Also, if you'd like to find out more information about this ministry or you'd like to give to this ministry, you can visit us online at lbbc.info. Thank you for watching. God bless each and every one of you.